Lisa. Yes, baby girl. When I grow up, I want to be a woman to society. Then so shall you be. Hey everyone, this is Lisa Landry. Welcome to Well Menace to Society. I have the great privilege of sitting today in North Pole, Alaska. Yes, it does exist. And I am here with Santa Claus. And yes, he does exist. Hello, Santa. Hi, Lisa. Thank you for inviting me to Well Menace. I appreciate it. I appreciate you being here. And that is your legal name. That's my legal name. And how did that happen? That happened about 12 years ago. That would be 2005. Um, I had been, I had grown out my beard the year before, and a lot of the nonprofit organizations where I was living at Lake Tahoe at the time uh, wanted me to volunteer as Santa, which I did. It was well received. So that February, I was out walking on a cold day up in the mountains to the post office, and it was cold, but kind of clear weather, and some of the cars had their windows open. So this one white nondescript car came up the road, and I had been praying. I'm a monk and also clergy, and been praying what I should do with this new look with the white beard and stuff. And one of the questions I asked during my prayer was, should I change my name to Santa Claus? And right after I finished praying, maybe 20 seconds later, this white car came up and windows were open, didn't see who was inside, but whoever it was sounded like they were in their early 20s. It was a guy, and he shouted out, Santa, I love you. And this was in February, so and I just finished praying, so I took that as a, a sign. Oh, I think that'd be a definite sign. Prayer. So that's how that initially happened. <laughs> that's fantastic. But it's been good because at Lake Tahoe, I do a lot of child advocacy, so I'm constantly calling up U.S. senators and governors, asking them to do thing for, things for child health, safety, and welfare. And once in a while, I get a bill that I want to help support, um, like Aaron's Law, something like that. And I'll call up, and back then I was saying, hey, this is Santa Claus from Lake Tahoe. That does, doesn't have the same ring as this is Santa Claus from North Pole, Alaska. Mm -hmm. And that's what prompted me to move up here. Because I was successful doing it from Lake Tahoe, but now it's like 99% effective, which is pretty good. Right. That, that upped your political pull? It does. Yep. You're the actual living Santa Claus. <laughs> Megan Kelly was right. You're a white dude. <laughs> I am a white dude. But you, back in the old days, back in the fourth century, um, he was uh, from the Mediterranean area in the now in the area now known as Turkey. So he had darker skin mm -hmm. than mine. And Santa Claus, the name. I'm not sure if you know what it's based on. No. Years ago, Saint Nicholas in the fourth century, who lived over there um, in Asia Minor, he had this whole reputation for being kind to children and he had come from a wealthy family and spread his wealth around and back then for women in particular who uh, whose families didn't have a lot of money their only other option aside from being married to somebody was to go and do essentially prostitution so Nicholas Saint Nicholas is what he became but Nicholas at the time who was a bishop um, gave dowries essentially on behalf of the families to these women. So that's how he sort of the gift giver reputation started. Well, the Dutch years later picked up on that whole thing and their expression for St. Nicholas is Sinterklaas. And when the Dutch, and they have a feast day on December 6th for St. Nicholas in most places of the world. Anyway, when the Dutch settled New York, which is now New York City, but back then was called New Amsterdam, they brought that tradition, the Feast of St. Nicholas and Santa Claus with them. Well, Santa Claus became Santa Claus, and because Santa is a feminine word, so Santa came from the center, Klaus. Anyway, make a long story short, um, Santa Claus became Santa Claus, and since his celebration was on December 6th, and they didn't have many resources back then, they decided to combine that celebration with Christmas. So that's how Santa Claus, Santa Claus became associated with Christmas. Oh, wow, I had no idea. Most people don't. And a lot of people also confuse it with Kris Kringle, which is an entirely separate that's tradition. That's something totally different? That's a German tradition, and that comes from Christ Kindle, which means Christ child. So that's talking about Jesus. That's Kris Kindle, huh. Kris Kringle. Totally separate. That's mind blowing. But both have religious origins. So people who say that Santa is stealing Christmas from Christians, et cetera, et cetera, 
are mistaken. They all have religious roots to them. Well, and there's a lot of fake news running around. There's a lot. That's what I hear. <laughs> And tell me, tell me some of the advocacy work that you call up these people in Washington about. Well, health, safety, and welfare. There are a lot of children who are going through the adoption process or foster care. A lot of states have different regulations, but they're not necessarily uniform. Most of the states have been trying to agree on certain things, but sometimes children will fall through the cracks or the parents can't quite go through all the hoops to uh, make an adoption happen or foster care for that matter. And it's tough on the children. Um, I used to see a lot of children fall through the cracks when I was in law enforcement uh, a long time ago. Um, it's hard to believe that... police officer, or were you...? Uh, well, back in 1971 and 72, long before my Santa years, I had an Irish name back then, but I was special assistant to the deputy police commissioner of New York City. Wow. That was a long time ago. What the heck did you do when you were in that position? I had all sorts of jobs. I set up the first video unit in any police department in the United States, and um, that was subsequently copied by a lot of other departments, sheriff's offices, federal agencies, etc. They used it for training, surveillance, um, that sort of stuff. Okay. It was fascinating because I was very young at the time, and there I was in leather pants, believe it or not, a work shirt. I had hair halfway down my back, a big mustache course was a lot younger and uh, had a ball. I was like number eight in the police department. So out of 26,000 back then, now it's like 38,000 people in the police department in New York City. And that was in New York back in the 70s. Yep, early 70s. That's uh, Back before the gentrification and yeah. you had to just be a trust fund kid to afford a one bedroom apartment. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much except in certain places like Greenwich Village where it's, that's where I used to live. Mm. Yeah, it was fun back then. I Only had two people to report to, which was even better. <laughs> The police commissioner and my boss, who is the uh, deputy commissioner of administration. So the, what kind of stuff did you see when you were a police officer with these kids? I uh, just saw a lot of kids being left behind, a lot of kids being abused, exposed to domestic violence, um, poor educations, um, a lot of injuries at home. Probably hungry. A lot of them were hungry. Some school programs took care of some of that, but not uniformly. So it was kind of frustrating to see and through the years um, in and out of law enforcement I've had ability to sort of calm people down in extreme situations I had become a police chaplain for a while and people seemed to like it the law enforcement people liked it because they could go about their work and I would sort of take care of the survivors of whatever incident it happened to be and a lot of people back then started suggested that I go into the ministry, which is what I did eventually, and a, bi a bishop in the small church and a monk in the order of the Anam Kara. And Anam Kara is the Gaelic or Celtic uh, word for soul friend. Mm -hmm. So what do your vows include in that, in that <laughs> brotherhood? Uh, well, we have Santa, a choice. you're blushing. We have, <laughs> we have a choice of vows. Um, I chose poverty. Some other people picked chastity and other things that they were interested in having as part of their life. But you didn't give up marijuana. I uh, did not. Yeah. I used cannabidiol to treat my cancer. Um, I was diagnosed about mm, almost five years ago and refused chemo and radiation since my particular cancer was caused by exposure to chemicals and radiation. So why would I take chemotherapy and radiation to cure what Makes caused sense the initial cancer? Right. So I stuck with uh, the combination of uh, THC and CBD, uh, cannabis, uh, mostly CBD, and it's kept my cancer at bay for, I shouldn't say my cancer, it's kept cancer in me at bay for um, almost five years now. God bless. Yeah, so I'm pleased with it. Excellent. And I rarely smoke it. I usually take it as cannabis oil, which is sort of like an oil that you can squirt under your tongue using what looks like a syringe make a long story short <laughs> <laughs> and it works and it keeps me in good humor and I look at a lot of people who've gone through chemo and radiation and I'm glad I opted out yeah. of that it seems like a very difficult journey mm -hmm. it's a difficult journey for anybody who has that and you advocate for pot up here I do our city council in North Pole Alaska approved having a dispensary and then some people who are upset about that decided to put forward a proposition that would ban dispensaries 
from North Pole. Boo. Anyway, they prevailed, and we're not allowed to have dispensaries now in North Pole, Alaska, which is a small community of 2,200 people or so. But the neighboring borough, we have boroughs up here instead of counties, the neighboring borough that we're in, and uh, Fairbanks, which is about 15 to 20 miles away, depending on which area Fairbanks you're going to, um, permits dispensaries. And we just had a big um, election about that earlier this month, and people who wanted dispensaries prevailed, so I was happy about it. So you're going to get your dispensaries? We have dispensaries now, but they were going to try and close them down. Oh, okay. All right. So now uh, people don't have to ask you to deliver it on a sleigh or anything That's like right. that. The elves don't have to be bothered with it. The reindeer don't have to be bothered with it. You can focus on the good <laughs> I work. I don't have to be bothered with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all good. And, and you're they say Santa's supposed to be a jolly fellow, right? Yeah, you better, you better stay high. That's usually. part of your job description. Mm -hmm. Ho, ho, ho. That's right. <laughs> and you're on the city council. How did that happen? I am happen? on city council. Um, I ran as a write-in candidate a couple of years ago. And I guess people liked what I had to say and wrote my name in. It's a pretty easy name to remember, so I was lucky on that score. And have been serving for two years. Got another year to go in my term. I won't run again. No? No, three years is plenty. And I'm also on one of the state commissions. So, um, And you have toys to make, joints to roll. <laughs> toys to make. I don't. I hardly ever smoke, so I don't roll any joints. <laughs> but Don't I ruin it for me, Santa. I know, I know what you're saying, but I have my own version. <laughs> 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 so what kind of stuff are you doing on the city council up here? Uh, well, the things that draw the most attention are annexation and taxation, things like that, that get people to actually come into our meetings most of the time. The audience area or attendees, you know, they're hardly, they are hardly ever show up. Really? But they like to complain after we make a decision about stuff. So it is what it is. It's a sort of politics on a smaller scale. But there, we've been very blessed to have had, at least the two years I've been here and now this third one coming up, a very well-rounded city council. We have at least one person on city council out of seven, including the mayor, um, who represents even the smallest portion of the population here with whatever they would like to see government doing. So no one's left out, whether it's an LGBT question or the pot question or taxes. In fact, the taxes is a good example. Um, right after the proposition passed that banned a dispensary, City Council, who had previously approved a dispensary, um, decided, well, now we're losing more than $50,000 a year in tax revenue from what we would have had from uh, cannabis sales. So um, we elected to cover that shortfall by increasing the sales tax. So if people don't do their homework when these propositions come up, they're going to get stuck with things they didn't anticipate uh, later on. So the people who are pro um, banning a dispensary at the time, that resulted in a tax increase. So um, people have to pay more attention to what their politicians are doing and why they're doing it. Do you think a lot of politicians sneak stuff under the rug? Not so much here in city council. We're pretty transparent here, and we give a lot of notice, but on some government levels, like the federal level, <laughs> I would say yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to leave that there. <laughs> I want to talk about Katrina with you, because, you know, okay. I'm from New Orleans area. That's where I... I know. I mentioned to you, I left a little message for you saying that during, or right after, not during, but right after hurricanes Katrina and Rita, I was working with the Federal Emergency Management Agency responding to disasters, and that was those were two of the disasters. And we, our response unit was stationed in Dallas, Texas. And it was a federal disaster recovery center. And we were set up on the state, federal, and local level to award different grants of aid, et cetera, to people who had survived the, the hurricanes, who were being shipped over by FEMA or whomever to uh, Dallas mm -hmm. um, to get their feet back on the ground. It was quite the experience. Um, the director of that particular center wound up putting me at the front door, essentially, to comfort families and children um, coming in. I was wearing the FEMA, the blue FEMA shirt with FEMA written on it and the jeans and welcoming people. And people were 
wonderful. Uh, the people who came in, when I'd ask them how they were doing, because some were having a tough time, um, most of them were. The offer, the answer I got most often was, uh, we're blessed. Which, when you see people in really bad shape, it's unexpected to hear the word blessed. But that's how they felt, and they were, of course. But um, it was very kind of refreshing and a good lesson for those of us working on the front line with uh, FEMA at that time. I bet. There was one, uh, at one point I was talking to some children, and off to my right I heard this faint little voice saying, Santa, Santa. Like that, I thought it was another child, but I turned around to see who it was, and about 20 feet away there was this wheelchair, and there was an elderly woman uh, sitting in it, and she said, Santa, I've been waiting 94 years to meet you, Santa. You come over here, boy. Like that. And there's this beautiful black woman who uh, was there with a ton of other people that just wanted to say hi to Santa after all those decades of thinking about Santa in New Orleans. So it was kind of refreshing to see that kind of attitude. It was, it was kind of cute. And it reminded me, I have family... Part of my family comes from the New Orleans area back during the cotton farming days. And there's a little fountain outside the zoo in New Orleans, and it's called the Gumbel Memorial Fountain. Mm -hmm. And that's I know that fountain. my uh, mother's father's family. Oh, wow. Small world. It's a totally small world. Yeah, because, you know, I live in Nevada. Yeah. Yeah. I used to live in Lake Tahoe, so you know Nevada. It's that beautiful. Area. Nevada's beautiful. Alaska's beautiful, too. Yeah, it is. To me, it's like Nevada, but with snow. <laughs> and you ran for president. I did twice, twice. 2008 and 2012. It was quite an experience. A lot of the compliance stuff was driving me crazy because I'm just one person without an organization. What's that, the compliance me. stuff? Federal Election Commission stuff. All these filing things you have to make and setting up a bank thing and all sorts of Why don't you just call the Russians and say, give a brother <laughs> no, a sister? I guess they weren't <laughs> that much involved back then. It's they right across were. the way, but over in Alaska. Yeah, I can almost see it from here. <laughs> <laughs> I know Sarah can see it, but I'm not sure too many of us <laughs> can see it. Maybe on a clear Well, day. she's on better oil. That's right. <laughs> what was your platform? Remind me. My platform, the slogan was, Restoring America's Heart and Soul. Um... I figured at the time, we way back in 2008 and 12, um, and <laughs> currently, in this past election as well, I think could have used a little infusion of heart and soul. Yeah. I kind of like Bernie myself. Um, I think he embodies that. But the chips fell where they fell. Yep. Can't go back in time. Mm. I like Bernie, too. <laughs> <laughs> but now that I see all the fallout with the changes regarding the environment and social services and the impact it's having on millions of children, like 75 million children, it's distressing to me. I would like to see some major um, changes uh, made. I think some of the appointments to head different departments are somewhat suspect and, in my opinion, um, lacking. Yeah. I'm saying that as clergy, <laughs> as a politician, and as a fellow who got all through his doctoral studies at New York University, never did the dissertation because of a timing thing. But um, I've had a fair amount of experience. One of the, well, I think I have a pretty good idea of how the federal government works or doesn't work. Doesn't work. Right. Right. They tell us it's working, <laughs> but I don't think it is either. And people talk a lot about those entitlement programs, stuff like that. Um, I see it a lot with little children. Children would actually run up to me and say, Santa, I want an Xbox or I want an iPad or whatever. And I'll usually look at them and smile and say softly, no, I don't want to hear your wish. And I said, what do you mean? You're Santa. And I said, well, what I'd like to hear is what you're planning to give someone else for Christmas. There's usually a pause. And sometimes the children will think of something um, to say after which I'll be happy to listen to their wish, whatever it happens to be. And sometimes they'll say, well, we don't have any money, Santa, so we can't get anybody a gift. And then I'll say, well, what do you think the greatest gift you can give someone is? 
And more often than not, the child, without any prompting, will come up and say love, which is true. Oh, you can make me cry. <laughs> that is so true. So what, if, what would you have done differently if you were our president? Because you did run twice. I did run. I had a great um, lineup for the cabinet at the time. And Who would um, your cabinet be? I'd have to go look up the paperwork now. But <laughs> it was, they were all people that wanted to stick with that um, heart and soul part of government. And they're few and far between, but they're the exact opposite of what's been put in place recently. And it kind of saddens me because this has an impact on all, you know, children look at what adults do for better or for worse. And I think at the moment we're encouraging children to um, be hateful, spiteful, um, not necessarily as loving as they should be. And it's, it saddens me. So I would like to see some major changes pretty soon and it's not so much having to do with the party or even with a particular candidate there's a bunch of candidates and a bunch of people who are in political office now who are not serving their constituents or this country well and I think it's pretty obvious to people in our country and people outside of our country and to God so I would like to see some major um, changes I think we need to start listening to each other more. Mm -hmm. That's one place to start. There just seems to be so much hatred and upheaval, finger pointing. But it's kind of like every time you point a finger, you got three coming right back at you. That's right. So. That's very true. But the nice part is comedy and keeping a sense of humor. I like to see that prevail rather than what we're dealing with right now. It does seem like we're having a shift in consciousness, though, doesn't it? Or maybe I I'm just so. being too optimistic? I think pe people are speaking out more about their preferences. And our most recent um, occupant of the White House uh, was only elected <laughs> by, um, what was it, 25% of the Yeah, a lot of people didn't come out. Voters. A lot of people didn't come out to vote. So to say, oh, I have a mandate to do this, that, and the other thing is bogus, I think. Um, if his opponent had won, she wouldn't have had a mandate either. So something very fundamental has to, to change. That's why I think a lot of people were heartened by Bernie's campaign and some of the campaigns that are going on right now at the state and federal level and even local level, like little city councils like ours here in North Pole, that change is afoot. And I think we'll start seeing that this next election cycle, and it'll be increasing from then on, I hope. At least that's what I'm praying for. Yeah. And particularly for children. You know, we have to set a better example for children. It's supposed to be love, not fear. I wholeheartedly agree. These kids are nonpartisan. They're just human beings that have no power. That's right. They can't even get themselves a cookie just That's to deal right. with the stress eating of being upset. Yeah, and they look to us for some sort of direction, and many aren't allowed or thinking for themselves is not encouraged and sometimes is drummed out of these children. And we see it in the education. Um, yeah. I would personally like to see that the U.S. Department of Education be a clearinghouse for all sorts of educational programs throughout the world, some of which are more effective in certain aspects. But let states here choose which parts of those programs they would like to adopt um, for their state. And then if a state makes really poor choices, no one's going to hire their adults, and that situation will change pretty quickly because of the economics. And that's what's coming if we don't get it together. Exactly. Yeah. I don't think people are looking 10, 20, 35, 45 years down the road. So many of us make our choices based on what's now. Mm -hmm. And that next set of uh, bills are going to come down. Yep. You know what I mean? We're not taking care of these kids. And there are a lot of unanticipated consequences. Yeah. Of things. And, and, and there's karma. And there's karma. <laughs> That's right. With karma, a lot of people don't realize with karma, you're not supposed to, like when you die, you're not supposed to have excess good karma or excess bad karma. You're supposed to be neutral. 
That's the whole thing. That's with the whole purpose. Karma. You have to yeah. walk right. <laughs> I don't think a lot of people understand the concept. Like God right. is the one who created karma. That's a universal law put into place. Yeah, and we so all experience it. God has later. other things to sort out and deal with. So He's like, you run this, and or, you know, or she has other things That's to right. deal with. So there's a lot Creator has to focus on. Human beings just go ahead and work through your stuff. It's all part of the Akashic record anyway. That's right. Yeah. Oh, I got it right. Santa agrees. I want to have a big, big candy cane in my in my stocking for that Santa <laughs> this year. I'll do my best. You can make it medicinal if you want to, right. brother. Okay. I don't want to alienate anybody who listens to this podcast because I didn't vote for our current president, Donald J. Trump. And I, I think a lot of people voted for him because they didn't want stuff status quo. Yeah, I think they wanted a change. A change. But I think, unfortunately, one of the things that this particular person in office has is has a problem with his predecessor in particular and is doing more to negate what his predecessor did than build on what his predecessor did, perhaps change it. But instead of doing this in a positive fashion, he's blocking out pretty much everything from the recent past and just doing the exact opposite, which really doesn't serve our country well. And to have that sort of personality where it's sort of vindictive to you, I'm not sure if that's the correct word, but I think it's pretty close, um, really isn't, in my view, uh, an effective or good presidential posture because um, it's aggressive it's it's aggressive it's uh, more of dividing up people it's not sort of president of the United States it's more president of states that's a good way to look at it and what do you think about this North Korea action <laughs> um, I don't I think we're in, in some trouble because Unlike Saddam Hussein, um, and despite whatever people think about our intelligence community, et cetera, I think there's some pretty bright people in there, but despite our misreading of either intentional or otherwise of what was going on back then, um, North Korea can actually do something to back up what they're saying. Saddam Hussein couldn't. So... It's not like we're going to run over and do something to North Korea without some pretty severe consequences, um, consequences that will have an impact again, you know, building up the military, et cetera. Um, my heart goes out to a lot of people who serve in the, the military, but I think they have a hard taskmaster. I don't think it's so much protecting our liberty or our freedom. I think it's more they're being assigned to... Um, efforts that are going to increase the wealth of the 1% in our country, and isn't, I'm not for that at all. Isn't that what usually uh, happens in a war? Oh, yeah, Someone defense will contractors and the, the rest of it, yeah. yeah. And politically, it draws attention away from other more um, critical but um, essential things like health, safety, and welfare. Um, and here we have this gigantic budget for defense, but we can't afford to help people in Puerto Rico. I lived in Puerto Rico for a while, and also the U.S. Virgin Islands, and they're struggling, and these are United States citizens. And to go through what they've been going through recently is really poor form. On the part of this administration, we I could think. do better. We could do better, way better. And, and having you know worked with FEMA, I know we could do better. Um, I think the Coast Guard's been doing a, a wonderful job, the best they can, just like they did during Katrina and Rita responses for those hurricanes. But I'm sort of left wondering why. This administration keeps making these decisions that have a very negative impact on our health, safety, and welfare. And I think you were talking before about short-term gains versus long-term. 
uh, projections. I think um, the long term is just being totally ignored, whether you look at the banking sector or the defense sector or um, even health care. I mean, just look at what's happening with health care. Why can't we just get Medicare for everybody? I would love to see that. I'm on Medicare because I'm 70 years old now, and Medicare has been you know, great for me, and it has been for people in other countries that have equivalent you know, systems. Ours is lacking. I like what Bernie had to, to say about Medicare for all and what a lot of other senators are saying about it and countries. And I would like to see that happen here sooner than later. And what some of these cuts that the administration's been proposing have a profound negative impact on child health safety and welfare. Uh, a lot of children are falling through the cracks through no fault of their own. And just to have an administration that's adamant about tearing apart a predecessor's uh, programs instead of trying to improve them um, or offering replacements that just aren't well thought out, particularly for the long run, um, I think is unconscionable. So my heart goes out to the children and their families who are suffering as a result of some of these decisions that are being uh, made. And as we talked about earlier, I think it is you know, a lot of people say, oh, the president's responsible for this, or the leader of the House is responsible, or, you know, whomever they try to pin it on a person. Well, no, it's the voters who are responsible for this. They're oh, yeah. basically not well-educated enough to know the issues or what the impacts of certain decisions will be. And we're only told half of it, if that. If that. Like, you get this little, this little piece of information, mm -hmm. but then you don't hear all this other stuff. Yeah, and kids look at this. You see it in the textbooks, and the textbooks don't really reflect what history was. It's a lot to begin of propaganda, with. isn't it's it? It's a lot of propaganda. <laughs> and then when children now grow up, they're going to be looking at things like the World Trade Center bombing and then the planes and all that stuff, or President Kennedy being shot, or his brother being shot, or Martin Luther King. Nobody seems to have the guts to get to the bottom of why these things, these specific incidents, occurred and whether they're inside government or outside of um, government, um, nobody seems to have the will um, or the strength or inclination to uh, getting to the bottom and holding people accountable. The United States has a really poor record in holding people accountable for stuff, whether it's a corporation or a government agency or whatever. It's, oh, well, we, we just denied your permit for whatever. Well, no. A particular individual or a small group of individuals, you know, denied. The your corporation permit. denied your permit. Right. Yeah. This is a corporation. Mm -hmm. But it's actually individuals. Yeah. Well, they do it, and they're the ones who should be held accountable. But they get held up or upheld by these yeah. machines. Unfortunately. Yeah. Isn't that unfortunate? It is, particularly for children. You know, how are corporations people? I mean, I don't know how they got away with that one. <clears throat> but to have yeah, a that was child a Supreme try Court decision yeah. a few years back. You would know more about that than I. Yeah, it was. But um, I do know corporations are actual people, according to the government. Very counterintuitive, isn't it? <laughs> it is. To me, that's just, it's patriarchy, though. It's that, that double think. It's like, we're, we're going to tell you this, but we're going to do this. And, you know, but I don't know. I see it differently. I, I think we're uh, we're all going by these laws that were set in place by some of our great, 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 great grandfathers. Mm -hmm. And that meaning some of us, meaning not all of us, meaning just one segment of the population, the landowners, you know, mm -hmm. I do know. making up all these rules and we're still kind of living under this false idea of being free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the children see all this. You know, what kind of a future is that to present to children why you know children look at us well how come all these people in darfur or other places are starving to death i mean we have enough money in this country that's just sitting it's not even doing anything productive but just sitting in banks or in property or whatever that isn't being used for anything constructive and now someone wants to talk about let's say the inheritance tax <laughs> right. which affects what 0.6 percent of you know people 
and that's billions and billions of dollars, which could go to education or something else the government might be interested in doing for people instead of two people. Yeah, you should have been president. I should have been president. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a woman, of course, but you're being a woman, and there are plenty of women around. I'm looking at all the Me Too campaigns and all the other stuff that's coming out and somebody grabbing whomever by whatever. Right. Um, and if I were a woman, I would be really ticked off that um, men are making it this difficult. And what kind of a lesson is that for children? Exactly. Why should younger boys feel as though they have to control a woman, for example? They're taught it. Yeah. 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 And they're... But it's taught at every level. It's yeah. taught in the family. It's taught in the community. It's taught in school. It's taught in phys ed. It's taught pretty much everywhere. Well, it's patriarchy. That, it's the imprint on the little boys, too. It, it damages young boys who grow into men who are just as caught up in the system because they've been trained, if you're a man, this is, you know, how you're going to do it. And uh, It's a language, too. They say, oh, a woman was raped. Well, no, a man raped a woman. It's a whole different dynamic. Mm -hmm. So instead of concentrating on, oh, it's so sad this happened, blah, blah, blah. No, it's who did it, why, and how you're going to prevent it in the future. But no, they don't really talk about that very much or put the responsibility onto the guy. It's, oh, no, it's what was she wearing again? You know, what did which she is do? ridiculous. Yeah. Right. Where was she? Yeah, and kids pick up on that as well. And people's tones of voice and... The whispering. Yeah, the whispering. I remember the like, whispering. That'd be crazy. So for me, um, as Santa, it's difficult seeing children exposed to those kinds of paradigms that aren't really set up in their best interest. It's shifting. We're dialoguing now. I will tell you, there's change already. I had to take three flights to get here, and there was no man spreading. No? <laughs> and okay. typically when I'm on the flight, I have to, you know, just stand my ground. Kind of <laughs> like, and stuff in here. Set the tone for the first 20 minutes of the flight. Like, uh-uh, brother. Uh-uh, I'm in my space. You stay over in yours, or we're going to be cool. But uh, there was none of that. There was none of that trying to move me just a few inches to the left or the right. How about TSA? TSA? I'm trying to... Um, TSA, actually, I'll tell you what, I'm not a fan of the TSA. I think it's, I think it's security theater. I've gone through plenty of checkpoints with stuff, and I get to the other side of the go-through, and I'm like, oops, I shouldn't have had that. Didn't mean to. It wasn't trying to break any laws, but... How about the little children getting searched and groped, et cetera? Oh, it's just somebody wants to touch a kid, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I think it has more to do with that love versus fear paradigm. As long as people can instill fear in other people... They think they can control them Definitely. more effectively. And that's what I see coming out of the White House. That's what I see coming out of the different agencies, federal agencies particularly, and sometimes state agencies. You know, even our legislature has problems here in Alaska. Uh, we have a lot of remote areas. and That's why I like it. But it makes it difficult for somebody who might be LGBTQ or makes it difficult for somebody who might be weaker or being bullied. Um, it makes it difficult for people that have their own voice and don't necessarily blend in and really shouldn't have to. The outliers, the visionaries. Yeah. So I know there are a lot of changes going on. I hope I live long enough to see some of the good ones um, come through. Well, you keep taking that CBD. Yeah, I will. <laughs> In the meantime, for people who are worried about Santa Claus, the North Pole, and dying, um, <clears throat> be aware that it's the Christmas spirit, it's the spirit of love, it's the spirit of giving that lasts. You know, it's not a particular person. So there are plenty of helpers out there who are willing to pick up where I might leave off or another Santa might leave off. So you're never without a Santa Claus somewhere. Never, ever. You can always tap into love. That's right. Thank you, Santa. Thanks, Lisa. It's been my pleasure. It's been mine. And I want that red bike you never brought me when I was eight, okay? So if you can do something about that. So I give a blessing to your, to you and to your listeners? Yes, please. That's better than a bike. May, this is Santa Claus, North Pole, Alaska. May you have a lifetime filled with happiness, peace, good health, prosperity, and most of all, love, which is the greatest gift. Amen.
Thank you so much, Santa Claus, for sitting down with me and for all of the listeners. And thank you for everything you're doing in North Pole, Alaska, for the kids and the other people there in the community. Special shout out, Ari, I love you. I wish you were here. Santa has something special for you, and I'll bring it to you.